This is Inside the FLX from FingerLakes1.com. I'm Ted Baker, and my guests in studio today are Brian Murray, State Director of Rural Development with the United States Department of Agriculture, and from Washington, D.C., the Undersecretary of Rural Development with the USDA, Sochil Torres Small. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Madam Ted. Secretary, happy to have you here. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Brian, and your office and what it does. You are a lifelong rural New Yorker yourself, so who better to lead rural development in New York State? Well, I, I am, yeah. I'm originally from uh, Madison County, a little town called Peterborough, and, and uh, lived in an agricultural community, small community, and have seen all of the trials and tribulations of, of what the small communities of, of the state, uh, you know, face and all. So, but uh, I've, uh, my, my background, um, I, you know, obviously came from Peterborough, and I uh, first started out as a, a school teacher. I taught math uh, for a while at uh, the local uh, uh, high school there, and then I uh, worked for a, a local bank, a regional bank, as a commercial loan officer. And then uh, after that, I, I started with the rural development as a, um, a loan uh, specialist, and then worked up through the loan specialist to you know, an area director, and then on to uh, the uh, associate enterprise director, then acting state director, and now state director, which is really a, a quite a privilege, you know, to be appointed by the president. So you took a quick tour of Seneca Falls and went to the Women's Rights Hall of Fame. So tell us the story you were telling me before we went on, your connection <laughs> with women's rights and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Believe it or not, yes, Peterborough was kind of the birthplace of the abolitionist movement in this area, obviously, with Garrett Smith. And uh, Garrett Smith's cousin was Elizabeth Cady Stanton which uh, she, Elizabeth, uh, spent the summers in Peterborough with her cousin, and she literally stayed in the house that I grew up in. Um, so it, it's kind of wow. a, uh, kind of coming home, you know, to here in Seneca Falls, so. Now, one of your other previous positions was with the St. Lawrence County Planning Board. What are some of the specific challenges that North Country farmers are facing? Oh, I think it's not only North Country farmers, but I think it's, you know, across the state, most likely across the region here. You know, it's mostly dairy, obviously, but it's the, you know, with uh, New York State, the taxes, obviously, low milk prices, you know, and, and the cost of doing business. With um, the initiatives, you know, not only on the state level, level but op obviously on the federal level, to going into the green energy and developing that, um, the farmers are taking advantage of that. They have a lot of available land um, that they can, you know, put uh, solar farms on, you know, another different type of farming, you know, harvesting the sun, if you will, and, and providing good green energy. So let's talk about what USDA Rural Development does in New York, because you hear U.S. Department of Agriculture, you think farming, but your office does a lot more in housing and wastewater treatment and clean water projects financing for various projects so tell us about what USDA rural development does uh, on the on the state level you know as you said you know the uh, low-income housing um, to finance you know people's first homes um, and also to rehab uh, homes um, for the elderly it's called a 504 program uh, community facilities program dealing with the infrastructure which you know the president outlined as a main objective in his state of the union address so you know things like um, Oh, hospitals, uh, clinics, um, municipal buildings, uh, you know, fire stations, uh, you, you name it, you know, libraries is another one that, uh, you know, really are, are central building blocks of a, uh, of a community. Um, we also deal with the water and the waste programs, which is obviously a huge part of infrastructure, um, you know, to make sure that we have clean, you know, potable water and uh, with the sewer systems, you know, it, it protects the environment. So obviously, in order for agriculture to thrive in rural New York, rural New York has to thrive. So a lot of these programs yes. are about keeping that base in place and, and giving people reasons to stay in these rural communities. Exactly, exactly. So we don't have anything really to do with agricultural production, but it's the support of that agricultural community um, and business, agribusiness itself, that, that we are involved in, you know, through business programs, through infrastructure, you know, through housing, fair, um, 
we have farm labor housing programs that, that help with uh, some of the labor issues you know that, that farms are um, experiencing these days so yeah we uh, you know are in a, a whole different uh, realm of you know the farm uh, um, economy but a very important part looking in your crystal ball 10 years into the future or 20 years what what are the issues that rural New York is really going to be grappling with it's a good question um, if I had a crystal ball <laughs> we um, yeah some of the I think really the the challenges I've been you know a point of, of what I've tried to do since my uh, appointment here in January is to start reaching out to every corner of New York State and to really dial into those local community communities and hearing from the grassroots of what their issues are and one of the things that I really hear time and time again which I was just in Sullivan County uh, just recently in, in Chautauqua County same story um, is infrastructure infrastructure is huge um, you know water waste you know building their their uh, downtowns again with you know they have a you know every community has you know that section of buildings that they'd re like to revitalize and you know part of our charge is to give those communities those tools those resources to rebuild their communities when you go around and talk to these people in new york rural people are tough is there a sense of optimism that that we're going to get through these challenges we face and and thrive in the years to come we will They're, they are tough they're resilient you know this is you know these you know small communities they they've seen a lot through the years and uh, you know they have good direction um, they have you know specific goals you know that they would like to see in their their communities and again you know rural development as an agency um, we're here to provide that help that technical assistance well we appreciate you sharing the uh, story with us today and then best of luck moving forward we'll stay in touch and then we'll talk again definitely thank you we're also joined today by Sochiel Torres Small Under Secretary for Rural Development she reports directly to Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack welcome to you it's great to have you here thank you so much Ted it's wonderful to be here now we can do probably an hour to an hour and a half on your background alone so let's see if we can encapsulate it into a million words or less from <laughs> a farm family along the border in New Mexico to United States Congress Ag Committee and Armed Services that's a little unusual combination so just tell us about it, your background and what led you to this position well thank you so much I am I'm from New Mexico and uh, certainly have experienced through my family's history the opportunity that rural brings uh, and I'm so deeply grateful that my my grandparents were able to immigrate from Mexico to pick cotton in the Mesilla Valley which is where I grew up and then later got to represent I think it shows when you look back at anyone's history that rural opportunity is just so consistently there and we want to make sure it's consistently there into the future which is part of why I was so grateful to get to serve on the Ag Committee in Congress. Uh, I had a friend uh, who, in Congress who said uh, we represent the one percent, the one percent of people who supply the food and then in, in armed services the one percent of people who are defending our country and I certainly felt that way um, getting to just recognizing how much rural America contributes so that we know that when rural America thrives, all of America thrives. How many people in your position have had that background? I mean, you were a field organizer. You were right there with farm workers, hearing their stories, dealing with their concerns. I, I would expect that that's probably rare for somebody in that position. You know where it's not rare, though, is in rural development. It's one of my favorite things about rural development is that we have people on the ground serving the communities they live in. And, and I, that, to me, really enforces uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to rural communities, to being true partners with them. Uh, it's not, you know, what this is, these are the programs we have. It's, I'm from this community, just as you saw today, and I know how we can work together to get things done. The president just delivered his State of the Union address recently. Uh, what did you hear in that address for agriculture and for rural America? I was listening to the president's speech and was really excited about how much he focused on jobs and the economy, about building our economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And I see rural development as a fundamental part of that investment, whether it's supporting um, our farmers when it comes to renewable energy opportunities, as well as value added opportunities, especially with dairies, that's a crucial component, uh, or whether it's supporting that new business entrepreneur to get good, reliable internet so that they can have that business 
business in the home they grew up in instead of having to leave and go to the city. Uh, Brian also mentioned water and wastewater. That's that foundation of investment that can help grow an economy and support rural America and really all of America. Let's talk about broadband because often when we talk about infrastructure we think of roads and bridges and water lines and things but in today's world it's critical. I know we have here in upstate New York several broadband initiatives going on so What's the plan to get more high-speed internet access to more rural Americans? Well, it is a crucial need. And of course, we saw that all the more in the midst of COVID-19. I was in uh, Picacho, Arizona the other day and was talking to some school kids who, you know, sometimes we talk about the technology, how hard things are, but they understood in a way that you couldn't otherwise, just what it's like to try to learn from home and watch that buffer screen as it's happening or have to coordinate your schedules with your siblings so that you don't have to you don't miss that crucial class or as so many people heard sitting in the parking lot in McDonald's and because it's the only place to get, get good internet so the plan as you asked is something I'm very grateful that under the Biden Harris administration the bipartisan infrastructure law is going to be investing all the more into broadband so they're sending some money to states they're also going through the FCC and then they're going through rural development and uh, uh, with the reconnect program Program. And what we've been able to do is both provide loans and grants to communities, to cooperatives, to businesses that want to invest in good, reliable internet and getting it to that last mile. We are laying fiber on the ocean floor, on the sea floor to reach uh, islands off the U uh, on the U.S. coast. We are getting to uh, communities, villages in Alaska that don't have a road. And, and getting uh, good, reliable internet there. So we're truly daring to go where no one's gone before. Being from the West, let's talk about water. There's only so much of it, and a lot of people want it, and it's really probably the key issue, I think, for the future of the West over these next 10 to 20 years. And the future of ag. And so as we look both to how, to how to make sure our water is clean and of good quality, but also that we have the quantity we need to do uh, the work that so many people do across rural America, uh, it's a personal uh, interest of mine. I, I worked in water law before going to Congress. And it's also an important issue when you think about what does it mean to make sure that no matter where you live, you've got the basic necessities because you live in our country. And so uh, sometimes that's hard when you're in a rural place, right? Rural, rural communities don't always get invested in the same way cities do. And there's no greater uh, example of equity if you have, than if you have to haul your water or you can't flush your toilet because you don't have a system. And so rural development is committed to working with communities, uh, places in Indian country, for example, where they're still hauling their water, um, to, to get systems in place, to support nonprofits that might be lending to, to increase your well capacity, uh, and also to be there in emergencies if your water system goes down uh, to try to address that as we're seeing increased natural disasters. So there's a lots of ways that we are planning for the future when it comes to water across rural America. Is there a way to solve these disputes over who gets it? Farmers need a lot. You have more residential development in places that aren't really very amenable to residential development unless you bring water in. Is, is that the big issue that you faced in water law and face in the future? Is that kind of fight over who gets it? You know, it's a funny thing uh, because quality and quantity uh, are often operating on very different systems, uh, but they they're the same problem, right? How do we make sure we have the water that we need? Uh, one of the opportunities, I think, especially when it comes to rural development, is making sure that the water that is used is used efficiently. And you can take that USDA-wide as well, NRCS. NRCS does a lot of work to make sure that water is used as efficiently as possible. Because with the water cycle, you only have we only have the same amount of water all the time. So using it as efficiently as possible, whether it's through a water system or whether it's supporting our ag community and getting them the water they need, helps helps us all share that pool. Is climate change something that's on your radar? Are you seeing, especially in that southwestern desert area that you're from, changes in the precipitation patterns? 
we're certainly seeing the impact on the ground. I mean, from my work in New Mexico uh, as a field representative for Senator Udall to then being in Congress, I was talking to the same farmers and their experience of what they'd seen on the ground dramatically changed. Now New Mexico is in a 200-year drought, the biggest drought they've seen in 200 years. And so the question is, how do we uh, respond from that? How do we become more resilient? And I'm so grateful that farmers are providing such a big part of the solution, uh, whether it's climate smart ag and connecting that to precision ag, um, whether it's soil additives or, uh, you know, that increased water efficiency that we were talking about, um, whether it's also looking at uh, ag forestry, for example, and how we use the products there to manage the forest better. There are all sorts of opportunities, and the question is, how do we quantify those impacts and make sure it is really taking on that challenge of uh, fighting climate change? And, I mean, we've made these advancements. It would have been unthinkable 30 or 40 years ago that we could feed more people with fewer acres of land more efficiently. But the American farmer just gets better and better at what they do. That is 100% true, and I'm hopeful that we can do that on the water space, too. I'm hopeful that we can do that on the climate space. Uh, and, And another part of that that I would just add is that it also helps us build stronger, fairer markets. Right? When you look at biofuels, for example, when, you, when, when we take a problem and we turn it into a market for rural America, everyone succeeds. So let's talk about the major piece of legislation that governs agriculture, and that's the Farm Bill. It comes up every five years. It's up again in 2023. What are going to be the major issues? It's always a very contentious debate in Congress, you know, having gone through it. What, what are we looking at in terms of the 2023 Farm Bill? Yeah, so as a former member of Congress, I certainly know that it's Congress that writes the Farm Bill, and I'm here in the administration ready to do what we're tasked with. Uh, but we're excited to, to have the conversation, to continue to uh, show what we've done with the ways that we've been invested in and shaped in the past, and, and to be there if they have questions. I certainly see rural development strength as being its people. Uh, as as having that mechanism that's so connected to rural communities across the country. And I'm interested in making sure that we have the infrastructure we need to continue to deliver on things like good, reliable internet, on water, and beyond. So that means making sure that uh, we, as we do these incredible programs, that we have the the staff that we need to do that. Um, 45% of rural development is uh, eligible for retirement. And they're staying because they love the mission, because they care about the work. But how do we make sure we're planning for those succession pieces? Also looking at what are the more efficient ways we can do our job. We've got people who are so tied to the mission, but they notice these little inefficiencies in the old technology that we have. And so they're thinking, well, gosh, I could get so much more done if we did things a little bit differently. So how can we invest in some of those technological challenges? And then how do we make rural development instead of we've got 47 programs and this is what they are and this is how they qualify to uh, what's your challenge how can we respond to it so that it's really a flexible rural development that's responding to new emerging needs here's a it's probably a partly political question and if you don't want to answer it that's fine but is the way we do the farm bill is that the best way to do it every five years in this big bill that leads to all this contentious debate or would we be better off doing it in smaller pieces That is a really interesting question because the one surprising thing about having served in Congress on ag and uh, armed services is that they're the two reliable authorizations that come. Right, so uh, with 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 uh, the uh, armed services, it's the NDAA uh, that comes every year, and with the farm bill, it's it's the farm bill. Um, The nice thing about that consistency is people expect it to happen. And I have seen some of the most bipartisan work happen with NDA and with the Farm Bill because people want to get it done. Uh, and sometimes otherwise authorizations wait for a long time to happen. Uh, but with that consistency, uh, it's, a, it's a continuous review of the work that's being done. Now, that's absolutely up to Congress about how they want to do it. Um, but I do see that consistency as being helpful for us as well. I think there's a general overall feeling across America that rural America is on the decline. Uh, Where are we going to go in the future? What's your vision for rural America down the line? You know, I... I love this job because I love getting to serve rural America. It it has fed and clothed and fueled our country for so long. And I know that all of our futures are tied up in the future of rural America. 
when I talk to people who are worried about their kid having to leave because they don't feel like they have a future at home, I also think about how we invest in that. You know, what's going to happen 20 years from now depends on what we invest in today. So good, reliable internet will be crucial to support the future entrepreneurs of rural America. Making sure that we have the high quality water that we need uh, to both the quantity of water to grow crops as well as quality water for people to drink it's going to be crucial so that people choose to stay and continue to make those incredible agricultural advancements that you were talking about. I know that the best resource in rural America is its people, is that resiliency. And as long as we're partnering with them, I think uh, we're, we're in good shape. What would your Mexican farming ancestors have thought if they had known one day you would be helping shape ag policy for the United States of America? You know, um, I think they were so proud to become Americans. And one of my, one of my nana's favorite memories was you know, she had to leave school um, when she immigrated to, to do farm work, and um, she had to study for a citizenship exam. And it was the time that she, like, the only time she was allowed to take time to study. Uh, and so, getting to then work to support. Uh, rural opportunity, which is what gave my family the opportunity to do this work, is just, um, I, I hope I'm doing her proud. Anything else that I haven't asked you about or any other point you'd like to make here today? Oh, Ted, thank you so much for having me, and I'm grateful to get to work for the Biden-Harris administration to become and to continue to invest in rural America, being true partners with rural America. Well, thank you so much. Thank it's you. It's been an education for me today. This has been Inside the FLX from FingerLakes1.com with Sochil Taurus Small, Undersecretary of Rural Development with the USDA, and Brian Murray, State Director of Rural Development with the USDA. We'll certainly stay in touch and uh, continue following these issues. Uh, we've been produced today by Nate Sharman, and we've got more great podcasts coming up, so thanks for watching. <laughs>